Jesus, we love you tonight. God, we thank you so much that we can be in your house. God, we thank you so much for all you have given to us, God. God, we want to come into your presence tonight with grateful hearts. God, help us practice being grateful. God, we want to give back to you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Church. 
We're glad you're here. If this is perhaps the first time you've ever been in a service with us, would you give me a big old wave? Just like, whoa, we've got a gentleman right here. Anybody else? Nope, you're the star of the show, sir. Welcome. We're glad to have you tonight. All right, uh, Mrs. Sharp has an announcement that she would like to give real quick. Good evening, church. Um, as most of you know, we've been doing a Samuel Center swing set fundraiser for our little ones to get a swing set put on their playground. And I just wanted to give a big thank you because we have raised... $2,670, so we're right at our goal. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Cool, cool. The other announcement is that tomorrow is Thanksgiving. So, we are going to have lunch here tomorrow at noon. Bring something sweet with you, like a dessert or something, or like a side dish or something, you know, something to share. Chocolate, Judy wants chocolate, so... Bring something along with you, and then there's lots of food that is going to be provided as well, like your main your main thing. So it's going to be really fun at noon. Don't miss it. Um, we are going to pray over our missions team at the end of the night, so we're going to go ahead and take our offering at this time instead of doing a missionary prayer. So. All right, Jesus, we love you tonight. God, we thank you that we can come into your house, God. God, we thank you that you have made a way for us to come. And God, tonight we give back to you. God, with our money. And Jesus, we just love you. God, we want to give back out of, out of what you've given to us, which is so much. God, bless this offering wherever it goes, whatever it does. God, let it expand your kingdom. We love you, Jesus.
God's good. I read a quote the other day that said, Thanksgiving's not just one day, it's every day. And I think we have to be careful to remind ourselves that all the time. It's because God is good and God should, we should be thankful for what God has done for us. Every single moment of every single day, when we rise up in the morning, when we go to sleep at night, God has done so much. Even during, throughout your day, there's so much that God has done each and every single day. And so it's helpful for us to always be in the posture of being thankful for what God has done for us. Can we remember that? Amen. Father God, we come before you right now, and God, we express our gratitude, God. We express our worship. We express, God, how much you have done for us. God, we are thankful for all the things that, Father, you have given us. God, but most importantly, we are thankful, Father, for you laying down your son and him shedding his blood so that we could be saved, so we could be a part of your family, God. We are so thankful for that. And God, pray, we pray that, Father, you would remind us of that every single day, of every single moment, Father. And sometimes when the going gets tough and sometimes when we don't feel like it, that, Father, you would just kindly remind us of the things and the places that you've taken us and taken us out of, God, that we've been reminded every single day of your goodness. We just pray these things in your wonderful name. Amen. Good evening. I know I'm not Darren or Hannick. If you read your bulletin, but uh, I'm filling in for him. He's having Thanksgiving with his family up in Lincoln, and so I'm grateful for this opportunity that I can be able to share with you uh, this evening. And, and the title of my message is simply this. It's God is a God of the valleys. God is a God of the valleys. I love being outdoors. I don't always like the things that are outdoors, but I love being outdoors. Most of the time. I love the scenery. I love uh, being out in the woods, my favorite state in the whole entire world. And if God would ever ask me to move there, I'd probably do it in a heartbeat. It would be Colorado. I love it. I love the mountains. I love the, the greenery. I love the scenery. And so something, there's something captivating about the beauty of his majesty in uh, the creation itself. And we think about some of the things in regards to nature we think about hills, we think about mountains, we think about valleys, we think about streams. There's a whole plethora of things that we can think about in regards to the nature of God. And he writes quite extensively throughout the Old Testament about some of these things, some of these ideas, some of these concepts. And he draws very much from creation itself to help us understand who he is. And one of the things that he draws upon quite often is the idea of mountains and valleys. The idea of there being mountains in our lives as, as men and women of God, as people that are on this journey, there are mountains in our lives. And that mountain, what oftentimes that looks like is those experiences we have in God where we feel like we're connected with him, where we're right, he's right there next to us, where everything's going well and we're on, you know, that's where we coined the term mountaintop experience because we're up on top. We're looking down and maybe sometimes we're looking back at some of the things that we've been through. And we're, we're, we're gr extremely grateful that we're up here and not down there anymore, right? And so that's the idea of mountains. And then there's the idea of valleys within the life of a Christian, and the life of us as men and women of God. There's this idea of valleys that we have to walk through. And there's a lot of times within the Old Testament, it talks uh, quite eloquently about what valleys represent and what it means to not only our path as Christians, but what it meant to the Israelites in their history and in their time. See, sometimes, I think oftentimes, at least in my mind, sometimes the valleys aren't very appealing, are they? The valleys are where we figure, figure that we're going to have to suffer the most, that we're going to have to go through the most, that we're going to have to maybe die. Some of those words, sorrows, tears, all these different expressions of things that we don't necessarily in our right mind want to do. <laughs> we don't want to embrace those things. And sometimes that's a characterization of the valleys in our lives. 
And so oftentimes when we think about valleys, it's easy for us to say, you know what? I don't want valleys. I don't want anything to do with valleys. Take me up to the mountains every single time. Leave me on the mountain. I don't want to deal with the valleys. But within Scripture, I believe it's important for us to have valleys. And I believe that Scripture points to the fact that valleys are very, very important to our lives. Very, very important to the character of how God builds and, and helps us become the men and women of God we're called to be. But first, we have to realize the valleys are important. So oftentimes, sometimes, and I want you to turn with me to the scripture, it says, in, turn to 1 Corinthians 20, 28. A little bit of a side note. Um, kind of along the, the sense of valleys and things like that. But... Probably an hour before I got here, my life was a train wreck. <laughs> I, uh, I was on a rush back from Quincy. I had bought groceries for the boys and things of that nature, so I was, I was on a rush. I wasn't probably going to get back to about 6.15, so I was already like, I need to get back. I'm stressing out. I'm going to get, you know, get ready. I had to download a PowerPoint. It was going to be, yes, there was going to be a lot of things that I had to do, and so I was stressing out. So... When you come out of Quincy, if you've ever driven that route, I think everyone has driven that route before. When you had to come out of Quincy, you have to make a decision either to stay on the left side or the right side. And the left side will take you to Canton, the right side will take you to Ewing, right? Or whatever that place is. So I was behind a really slow car coming here, and so I decided to kind of go past that car before we had to make the decision to get on either or. And so I made that decision really quickly, and I started passing this vehicle. Well, the guy behind me decided to pass with me. And so when I tried to go back into the lane, the other guy was already in the lane. And so I swerved into the lane. He got a little irritated, so he flashed his brights at me. And then, because I'm such a good Christian, I got a little irritated too. And so I slowed down a little bit and kind of pulled up alongside of him and gave him a little bit of a, a friendly little honk, a, a love, love honk. Um, and and so, so anyways, he, he moved on forward and, and, and pushed on past me. Right when he did that, I realized that I had just mashed my horn at a cop. And so he took off right in front of me, and I'm, and I'm now, like, even more stressed out because I'm like, this guy is going to be mad at me. He's about to pull me over. My life is over. I'm going to not be able to preach tonight. It's, 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 it's done. And so luckily, I don't know if God was in the mix or I'm just, it was just luck, but he decided to pull over somebody else in front of me, and that's the reason why he was trying to get past me. Um, and so my honking didn't, it probably disturbed him, but he had bigger fish to fry. So... So anyways, that started the process, and then I got home, and uh, my suits were hanging up wrong, so I, I wasn't even thinking, and I put on the wrong pants to the wrong suit, and so I was going to come up here with a multicolored suit on. They were actually really, mat like, it was close match, so don't think I was wearing, like, red pants and, like, a blue top or something like that. And so that even stressed me out even more. And then all of a sudden, I couldn't find my Bible, which if you're going to preach, you need your Bible up here. <laughs> and uh, so, so finally, when I got here at 545, I was kind of just, uh, or 645, I was just kind of done. I was ready to <laughs> get this over with. And then I was going to download this wonderful PowerPoint that I had painstakingly made for us tonight. And... It didn't save on my OneDrive, so I couldn't download it. So I don't know if this was a valley, per se, but I was going through a lot of stuff before I got up here to start preaching. And so things like that happen to our lives. Right. Things like that, we go through those things. And sometimes 
It's our decision whether or not we're going to choose to learn from it and go through it or throw up our hands and give up. And sometimes those decisions are life-changing decisions. And what we do in those moments characterize sometimes the destiny that God's called us into. And so it's very, very important for us to walk it out, I believe, the right way. And in 1 Kings 20, 28, it says this, And a man of God came near and said to the king of Israel, Thus says the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is a God of the hills, but he is not a God of the valleys. Therefore, I will give all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. There's two things that I want to get from this. Number one, there are some people that didn't believe that God was the God of the valleys. They didn't believe that God could be a part of the valleys. They believed that God was just in the hills. Guess what happened to those people? They died. <laughs> it wasn't good. That was the first people. The second people were the Israelites who said, you know what? We believe not only is a God a God of the hills and the mountains, but we very much believe in our hearts and and in our lives, that God is a God of the valleys. And we're going to embrace that, and we're going to live in that. And even if everyone says that he's not, we're going to believe in this. And, and it changed their perspective on things, and it changed their lives. And they were able to do this, I believe, because there were a lot of valleys that the Israelites had to go through. There were a lot of situations in their lives that they had to go through the valleys. And I bet at this point in time they realized, you know what? When the, when the Syrians said, you know what? God's not a God of the valleys. You don't know what you're talking about. The Israelites pulled their historians together and these, these people that knew the history of their people and pulled them together and said, you know what? Tell us the stories of God in the valleys. And they listened to them. And they remembered God is the God of the valleys. And so here's what I want to do tonight. I want to highlight some of these valleys that the Israelites walked through. And what I want to do in the midst of highlighting this is hopefully for you to be able to see God in history walking through the valleys. But not only God in history walking through the valleys, but God in your own life walking through some of these valleys with you. I think when I begin to reveal, illuminate some of these different valleys, you'll be able to say, you know what, I walked through that valley. And I hope that you can say, in the midst of me talking about this valley, I hope you can say, God was there. I remember what God did for me in that valley. Or if you're going through this valley right now, I hope you can say, you know what? I need to see God in the midst of this valley. I need to grab a hold of him. The first valley in the history of Israel was um, not in, within the history of Israel, but the first valley that I want to... Uh, talk about is in 2 Samuel 8, 13 through 14. If you'll turn there with me. And David made himself a name when he returned from killing 18,000 Syrians in the Valley of Salt. He also put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom, he put garrisons and all Edomites became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David wherever he went. Let me keep it, continue reading a little bit. So David reigned over all Israel and David administered judgment and justice to all of his people. If you read all of chapter 8, you will see that David... The characterization of David's life during this period of time was one of battle after battle after battle after battle. And even though it talks about his victory over and over again, I hope you understand that battles aren't easy to go through. Battles are tough. And I bet you anything that David had to watch some of his fellow brothers die on the battlefield. I bet you anything that he had to watch his own people die on the battlefield. I bet you anything that he had to take some cuts and bruises in the midst of this. And I believe that some of this, the, the Valley of Salt, the characterization, if you look at the words of the Valley of Salt, 
Number one, if you look at the word valley in this, in the Hebrew it means gehi, which the meaning of this means a narrow gorge. And if you characterize that with the meaning of salt, which is the Hebrew word mela, M-E-L-A-H, mela means this, rub to pieces, pulverize, to disappear as dust. And so when we look at this word, this valley of salt, we can come up with a definition for this valley of being something that is made up of suffering, hardship. And so what we see in David's life during this period of time is that in in chapter 7, he would just, the covenant of God was repronounced over his life. In chapter 6, he was dancing in worship and glorifying God. Now we reach chapter 8. This is where all of this comes into the place where he has to fight for it. And the fighting for it sometimes in this period of time, he had to suffer. He had to go through some hardship. He had to go through some character building in the midst of this. Even though he went through many years of character building, this is another place of character building for his life. And it's interesting to note in chapter 9 that through this character building process, it, it says within the chapter heading, if you have the ESV version, it says in one of the chapter headings, it says, the kindness he shows to Mehibosheth, which is Saul's son. I believe that David, in, be, because he walked through this valley, because he walked through the valley the right way, he was able to embrace the character of God in the midst of these circumstances in which he was supposed to rule and reign as king. And his first rule as a king was to show kindness on a human being that all other kings and all other rulers probably would show no kindness to. He showed kindness to them. And so what does this valley of salt mean? Well, it means this. God sometimes uses suffering to transform us into the children he has called us to be. And that place of transformation we find our victory. And it's the same place that David sings about in Psalm 60, the psalm he wrote while in this valley. If you turn there with me, Psalm 60. It says this, O God, you have cast us off. You have broken us down. You have been displeased or restore us again. Does that sound like somebody who's going through some trials, tribulations? You have made the earth tremble. You have broken it. Heal its breaches for it is shaking. You have shown your people hard things. And you have made us drink the wine of confusion. You have given a banner to those who fear you that it may be displayed because of the truth. Selah. That your beloved may be delivered. Save with your right hand and hear me. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and res- measure out the, the valley of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the helmet for my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my washpot. Over Edom I will cast my shoe. Philistia shout in triumph because of me. Who will bring me to the strong city? Who will lead me to Edom? Is it not you, O God, who cast us off? And you, O God, who did not go out with our armies, give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. Through God we will do violently, for it is he who shall tread down on our enemies. How many of you feel like you're going through a valley of suffering at times? Anybody going through that? Maybe sometimes it feels like everything is, it's hard, it's a battle. You're going through periods of maybe even sickness. Of, of physical ailments, of, you know, you're making decisions in your life in which your friends are saying, you know what, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. Where your family is saying, you know what, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. And you're having to make decisions that are righteous that are causing somewhat of a suffering spirit in your life. A suffering place in your life. Here's what God would say. For it is he who, tr- who shall tread down on our enemies. You're not alone. You're not alone in this battle. In the valley of salt, you are not alone. Here's another valley. 
Joshua 7, 26. Turn there with me. It says this, And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of the place is called the Valley of Achor. The Valley of Achor has a symbolic name also. The word for valley in this, there's actually five terms for the word valley in Hebrew. Okay? Um, I'm not going to cover them all, but three of the words that I do cover is Gei, Nekal, and uh, Eshkel. Those are the terms for uh, valley, and, and there's different meanings. The beauty of the Hebrew language is sometimes in our English language, one word means multiple different things. In the Hebrew language, the way they do it sometimes is oftentimes, especially with the different words, is there's multiple words that can also have the same meaning, but if you use this word, it changes the meaning to mean something a little bit different. And so the Hebrew language is sometimes a little bit more complex in its nature. And so the word nikal is the Hebrew word for valley that's used in this section. And the word is defined as this, a torrent, a torrent valley, or a wadi. The word for akor, the word for the valley, it means this in Hebrew. It means disturbance or trouble. And so if you apply those meanings together, if you would get a definition for the value of Echor, it would be a place, a torrent of disturbance and trouble. And if you look at the usage in Joshua 7.26, you'll see that there was trouble in this section of Scripture. If you read about the story of this Achan, Achan's sin, if you read the story about him in this section, he caused a lot of grief, not only for himself, but for the whole people of Israel. And because of his sin, there were major consequences that the Israelites had to face. And so they were in this situation of figuring out who caused this to happen. And Achan was the source of this sin. And you see that in this valley, that judgment was coming upon Achan. And so what does this look like for our life? Well, I th the valley can be, in this situation, a valley of correction and a valley of judgment. It, this is used also in Psalm 124, if you turn there with me. I hope you're getting some of this stuff because sometimes when you preach, you're trying to fit a bunch of pieces together. And I hope you're understanding that these valleys that, that, that are pictured within the Israelites' history, history, there are meanings behind this that if you look up the meanings, they are tied to the spiritual dimension of what God is doing in this situation. So, so, so oftentimes when God takes people to geographical locations in the Old Testament, it's not just an ordinary geographical location. It oftentimes represents something that is spiritually happening. There's something that's going on. And so when I'm pointing out these valleys, there is a significant spiritual happening that is occurring within these valleys. And so when I point out Joshua 27, 26, what I'm showing, hopefully, is that this valley of disturbance and tribulation is where God says, you know what? Let's stop the trouble. We're going to bring some correction here. We're going to bring some judgment here. We're going to stop this from happening anymore. And so what he does is it says in Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, 
then they would have swallowed us alive. When the wrath was kindled against us, then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. When it uses the term swollen waters here, it is talking about the same concept within the valley of Achor. This idea of tribulation, this idea of a torrent of disturbance that is happening in your life. And most of the time what the cause of that is, is because of our own stupid and rash decisions. And in order for us to walk out of that, you know what God has to do sometimes? Is he has to stop us and say, you know what? You need to be corrected. And so in this valley of disturbance and tribulation that sometimes you're going through and sometimes you're walking through, maybe because of your own decision making, there's probably in order for you to walk out of a place of repentance and a place where God's going to have to come down and judge. But the beauty of it is that if you walk it out the right way, the beauty of water is that it can also cleanse. It can also purify. It can also wash clean. Not only does the torrent sometimes strip us bare, but it also makes us the way we're supposed to be in God's eyes. In Psalm 84, 6, if you would turn there, this is the third valley. Psalm 84, 6. It says this. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. The valley of Baca, if you look at this word, emek, which is the word for valley that is used in this, the meaning for this is a deep valley or a broad depression. And the actual term for baka, the meaning for baka, the Hebrew word baka, it means weeping. And so when you look at the valley of baka, this is a valley of weeping, a valley of tears, a valley of deep sorrow. The reality is the tough things happen in life, don't they? There's sometimes where we are caught in mourning, where tears will flow, where we won't always be joyful. And there's mul multiple different reasons that this could be the case. But there is a place that sometimes we need to shed a few tears. And it's okay to be in this, this valley of weeping, this valley of sorrow. Because in this valley of sorrow, in this valley of weeping, if we turn to God, if we do what God is asking us to do in the midst of the circumstance, it can turn into a place of springs, a place of early rain, a place of pools, what it talks about in 84.6. And the rest of 84, it, it, it talks a lot about God coming in the midst of the circumstances and glorifying God in the midst of those circumstances. And so the valley of mourning can be very easily turned to a valley of joy based on the decisions that we make. Some of us may be walking through that the valley of sorrow, the valley of weeping. And I hope that God can reach you in the midst of those circumstances. There's another valley that I would like to point out. And this is in 1 Samuel 17. And probably one of the uh, most famous of valleys that is spoken about quite often. It says in 1 Samuel 7, 9, 17, 19, it says this. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Go down to verse 23. As he talked with him, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard them. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were very much afraid. 
Verse 32, if you go down there, it says this. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. The Valley of Elah. The Valley of Elah, Elah itself means an oak or a strong tree. Could be in reference to giants. Could be in reference to many different things. Strength. There is a dual nature to this valley. If you look at this, this story, there is a valley of not only fear, but of strength. The valley of fear came about in the valley of Elah because the Israelites saw the giants and said, you know what, we don't want anything to do with that. And they pulled back and said, you know what, let somebody else do this for us. Instead of turning to God, instead of realizing God was in control, you know what, they said, we don't want anything to do with it. And so it can become a valley of fear for us. The flip side of this is what David did in the midst of this situation is that he didn't walk in the valley of fear. He said, you know what, I'm going to make this a valley of strength for myself, the valley of Elah, a strong oak. And he said, you know what, we shouldn't fear. We have God on our side. Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go on and fight with this Philistine. And so the valley of Elah is really a decision for us in the midst of this, especially because we're facing giants in our lives. How many of you are facing giants in your life? I think we all are. You have a decision to either walk in fear, you have a decision to walk in strength. You have a decision to walk in your own strength, or you have a decision to walk in God's strength. And you get to make the determination of what valley you would like to walk in, in the valley of Elah. There's another valley in 1 Kings 19, 4 through 8. It says this, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he asked that he might die saying, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life for I'm no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stone and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him. And said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. Archaeologists have this place called uh, not just the valley, it's, it's sometimes termed the valley, but most often it's termed the plain of El Raha. It's right at the base of the possibility of, of being the place which is called Mount Horeb. And here is Elijah a prophet of God coming from probably the biggest victory of his whole entire life. A huge victory. I mean, he, 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 he basically stood in faith against a, a bunch of Baal worshipers and said, you know what, we're going to stand for God instead of all these Baal, instead of for Baal. And he made a decision, you know what, to believe in God, to walk in that faith, to walk in that, that promise. And God showed up. And showed up in fire. And he claimed a great victory in that moment. But right after this moment, it says that he went into the wilderness and began to have a pity party for himself. Began to feel despair in the midst of the circumstance. And sometimes there's valleys of despair in our life. This, this plain of El Raha could very much be a plain of despair for you. Where God has done great things in your life, where, where you feel like, you know what, I've walked out of victory, but all of a sudden, it feels like everything, the, the floor is kind of, or the carpet's kind of been pulled out from underneath me. Everything seems to be going wrong, where I don't feel like I'm questioning my identity now, I'm questioning who I am, nothing is going right in my mind, it feels like I'm in despair. And sometimes, oftentimes, when I hear of great victories, that happened in the kingdom, especially in people's lives where God has done something great, you know what? Satan wants to take that away from you. He doesn't like you to live in victory. And oftentimes after a great victory, there comes a place in which there's a great challenge. And sometimes when that great challenge shows up, it's very easy to walk in this valley of despair. The beautiful thing about the story is that Elijah, even though he walked in the valley of despair, who showed up? God showed up. 
And God, in the midst of the valley of despair, he said, you know what, I'm going to make this into not a valley of despair. I'm going to make this into a valley of rest. I'm going to give you food. I'm going to give you water. And this food and water was so good that it lasted him basically 40 days and 40 nights. He ate this food and basically traveled 40 days and 40 nights without eating another thing so he could get to his other location. God wants to do that in some of you guys' life. You're walking through a valley of despair right now. You're walking through situations where you just feel like nothing is going right. You know what God's saying? Is saying to you right now, he's saying, rest in me. Turn this into a valley of rest. I can feed you what you need to get you through this situation. And here's, here's what I would like to end with. If you read Psalm 23, I, I, I'm not going to read it for you right now, but Psalm 23 talks about a valley also. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. It talks about this idea of the valley. And within this characterization in Psalm 23, it also talks about how David, King David, walked out of this. If you look at history, if you look at what King David was writing about, and Psalm 23 was written from the perspective of right after the Civil War with Absalom. He had just won the Civil War, but he had just found out from his general that Absalom, his son, had died. And he was in despair, he was in sorrow, but he also was looking to God and saying, you know what, you, you, you caused a great victory to happen. And so if you read Psalm 23, you'll look at three specific things that helped David walk out of and not stay in this valley and change the valley into something that was good from bad. And number one, what David did was he recognized and drew close to the shepherd. It talks about it in Psalm 23. Let me turn there real quick. It says in Psalm 23, the very first verse, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There are 13 times within the chapter of Psalms 23 that God is mentioned. That God is mentioned not only as a shepherd, but somebody who leads, somebody who, who strengthens. Number two is this. If you want to walk out of your valley, if you want to walk out of your situation, if you want to turn your valley from something that is bad to something that is good, then guess what? You need to speak truth into the circumstance. In Psalm 23, it says several different words about truth. It says that he makes me, he leads me, he restores me, and he guides me. The recognition that God does things in your life is very, very important for walking out of the valley. The recognition of what he has done for your life is very, very important for walking out of this valley. So if you're walking out in a valley of despair, if you're walking in a valley of struggle, if you're walking in a valley of suffering, and all these other valleys that we mentioned, speak truth in the midst of this circumstance. And God can change it to something different. Lastly, and probably the most important thing of all, it says that David, or it talks about David praising and thanking God. He thanks God for the rod and the staff. He thanks God for preparing the table. He thanks God for anointing him. It thanks God that his cup is overflowing. He thanks God that goodness and loving kindness follow me. It's not just recognizing and speaking the truth. It is also thanking God for the truth in your life, for the things that he's done in your life. If you want to walk out of the valley if you want to walk out of despair and sorrow or even mourning, praise God for the situation. Praise God for what he's doing in your life. Praise God and thank God for what he is guiding you through. And, and through those circumstances, it's very easy to come out the other side with the right perspective, with the right heart. And when you're up on the mountaintop, you can be up in the mountaintop. But when you're down in the valley, you can be down in the valley. Amen? Amen? So here's what I would ask you to do as you're going about your life these next uh, holidays and things of that nature. Um, think about what valleys you're going through right now. 
If you're not walking through a valley, help somebody else through the valley. Think about the valleys. Think about what you're going through. And do those three things. Draw near to God. Speak the truth over the circumstance. And then praise God in the midst of it. If you can do those three things, then no matter what the valley looks like, then you're going you're to be able to get through it. Amen? Amen. Before we end tonight, we're going to have, uh, we're going to pray for the people that are going to Brazil. I'll turn it over to Pastor Palmer. Through what are two or three different places, two places, three places? They'll be going to one place and you're going to two. Okay. Okay. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, these that have followed your call and are going to this on this trip, Lord, to Brazil. Lord, we pray that your hand would be upon them, that you would anoint them uh, with your strength, Lord, anoint them with your power, anoint them with insight, Lord, as they go to uh, to the Fortaleza there in the, in the, in the favela and, and all that's in the work there with Mark and Ruth, Lord, we just pray, God, that you'd help them to be able to touch these children, to be able to speak life, Lord, in the midst of a place where there's much destruction and death, and Lord, we pray, God, that you'd give them the ability to uh, do great work. Lord, I know there's that things going on. Lord, we pray for this other church that David's going to where there's, they're having their anniversary celebration. Lord, I pray that you give him the words to speak. And Lord, that there would be great blessing that would happen in that place. But God, we just pray for your covering. And Lord, we just commit to stand behind them, Lord, and to cover them in prayer. Lord, we're looking for great things, to a great story, a great uh, res- uh, uh, T- uh, story to come back to us, Lord, of all the wonderful things you're going to do. And Lord, we just pray, God, your blessing upon them and upon the people, more importantly, even upon the people that they're going to. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. See you tomorrow for those of you who be here for lunch. <laughs>